Thank you all for sticking it out for the day. We've had a, a busy and full day of, of events. I am so thrilled to uh, welcome this next panel. We've done similar panels a couple of times with, uh, where we talk about trade around the world. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup here, and I'm especially grateful to my dear friend, Laura Lane, for her support for WIDA, for UPS's support. <laughs> Laura, it's uh, 23 years ago this month that you and I met in Geneva yeah. at the World Trade Organization. Uh, you were uh, uh, the secret weapon of the United States, uh -huh. running between all the different uh -huh. delegations. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, is this on? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was on the side of good, because oh, so the EU no, no, and no, the U.S. A... partnered um, in those <laughs> negotiations at that time, so yes. it was good. In fact, in fact, one of my memories is sitting there, I was a congressional staffer, was watching the U.S. delegation, the EU delegation, looking at each other, and there was sort of a head nod, and that was the agreement. <laughs> they, they, that was, got it, yeah, we're on it. If it only were that easy. Well, I think they, there was some problem with the French, but let's not get into that here. <laughs> um, uh, I will note um, the absence, uh, we, we had invited several, we reached out to several Latin American uh, embassies. The timing was just not good for several of them. They had new ambassadors coming or they had people who were in acting roles that weren't in a position to speak. So we'll try to come back and address some of the Latin America trade issues, but we did try to have that for this panel as well. We have a fantastic lineup. I am thrilled with the people that are here. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to Laura. So you guys know this is going to be the best panel. We saved the best for last. And, and I will just say, I mean, for UPS, it's a natural, right? Trade is so important to us. We carry 6% of US GDP and 3% of global GDP in our package cars, in our tractor trailers, in our air cargo holds, and in ocean ca containers that cross the oceans left, right, up, down. And um, for us, trade really does matter. But it doesn't matter for the reasons that you think. It's not about where UPS goes. It's about where we can take our customers to. And so for us, trade agreements are so critically important. And it's why we are such big champions of WIDA. And we want to continue this dialogue on trade. And so um, what better group of... Uh, uh, people to talk about the importance of trade than the incredible ambassadors that we are so lucky to have here in Washington, D.C., representing important countries with which UPS and many of you in the audience engage in trade. They are consummate professionals. They have their, uh, their leaders on speed dial. They have their um, country's interests at their fingertips, but they also know the art of dialogue and engaging and advancing their country's interests in partnership with the United States. And so um, we couldn't be luckier to have the panel that we have today. I'm going to introduce them sequentially um, because I want to give each an opportunity to talk about their country and the interests that they have at stake um, in terms of the relationship with the United States. And I thought I'd start with um, one of our longest serving ambassadors here in Washington, D.C., um, uh, Ambassador Mapuri. You are, uh, you joined in um, 2012. 2012. Yep. And in fact, Singapore was one of the agreements that Ambassador Zelik uh, negotiated, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. one of the one of the uh, standard setters in terms well, of. Well, he US took us to the cleaners, FTAs. but you know yeah. that's fine. No, that's all right. But you know <laughs> the what? The U.S. always takes you to the cleaners. Uh, UPS has great headquarter <laughs> operations yes. in Singapore, so let me tell you, good things have happened from yep. that. But um, I will say that um, it's uh, Singapore is one of the most prolific free trading nations, and you have a lot at stake in terms of the U.S.-Singapore, Singapore-U.S. relationship. So can you talk a little bit about um, some of the interests that you have, um, big and small, and, um, and how that partnership has flourished over time? Sure, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here again. I spoke here at the conference about two years ago. The audience was much smaller. So I think that as this audience grows, as the issues around trade become much more important, people have really refocused again on where the global trade agenda is. Now, you spoke about Singapore, and s most of you know something about Singapore. You may have businesses in Singapore. You may have negotiated with Singapore. Singapore is a hyper-globalized country. We are essentially driven by trade. Trade is three times our GDP. We cannot afford for trade to slow down. But what we have seen in the past few years are new challenges emerging around the issues of trade. And that's where we are 
constantly focused on. And this is not even considering the new coronavirus that has an impact on the region almost immediately. The implications of that we may only see after six to eight months. What we're starting to see in our region, and these also expand more globally, is more geopolitical conflict. And that's starting to have a lot of questions around where is global trade going to go because geopolitical conflict enters in, is, is really centered on what's happening in the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific between the US and China. The other factor that's come into play has been almost an anti-globalization mood. Singapore grew in past 20, 30 years because of a very pro-globalization uh, approach. Today, you're starting to see an anti-globalization mood, less in Asia, but in other parts of the world. And that has an impact, again, in how we see trade. The third area, and this may be a plus rather than necessarily a minus, is technological changes. So the future of industry, the uh, industry 4.0. But that means you've got to make adjustments from the traditional type of trading arrangements, which are all around goods, UPS moving things around, traditional, some services, but into digitalization. What is that new future of trade? And Singapore is starting to start to understand some of these areas and look at what we can do. First, on our relationship with the United States, I'm happy to report that after that agreement that Ambassador Zalik negotiated with us, it was a hard going. We made certain uh, difficult choices, but in many ways, it is an asymmetric relationship between the United States and Singapore given the different size of the economy. What the US-Singapore FTA did, which came into force in 2004, really linked up the Singapore economy a lot closer to the US economy. Today, we're one of uh, the United States' largest trading partners. The US is our fourth largest trading partner, and that's very significant. The US is the largest investor in, the in Singapore, and Singapore is a significant Asian investor here in the US. There are jobs that are supported on both sides, and we're very much part of that U.S. economic eco ecosystem. And in, in many ways for this administration, Singapore is a plus because the U.S. has a surplus with Singapore, both in trade and goods and trade and services. That's important for this administration, and I appreciate that it puts less pressure on me, but uh, it is something important to remember as well that because Singapore made certain changes in the way we conducted ourselves through the U.S.-Singapore FTA, we have been able to grow through taking advantage of our links with the U.S. economy. But even that, we've got to start looking into the future. It's an agreement concluded in 2004. We keep updating it, but there are new elements that have to come into place, understanding some of those global changes that we are trying to deal with, the issues around globalization, uh, deglobalization, the issues around digitalization. And in that, we partner not just directly bilaterally with the United States. We are looking at the whole WTO model because the w for a trading country, the WTO is a very important part of our trading relationship and framework. We need a rules-based system. When you are small, you need rules. You need a system that you can turn to if there are differences to be uh, sorted out. And that's where we put this focus on the WTO. We are focusing with uh, Australia and Japan <coughs> on the joint statement. And I think that's quite important, looking at that e-commerce future. Last month, Singapore, New Zealand, and Chile, and we, I'm happy that my colleague from New Zealand is here as well, substantially concluded our Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, which again hopefully becomes a pathfinder. In many ways, the way that the P4 was many years ago, pathfinder to the TPP, where Singapore, New Zealand, Brunei, and Chile sort of pointed the way, we now have our DEPA agreement, which we concluded, looking at what we can do in terms of the digital economy. There are other things happening in our region as well. Uh, we have got, we've substantially concluded RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. 15 of the 16 partners have. India has stepped away for the moment. And we're hoping to be able to have that signed sometime this year. The other significant change, and this happened in 2018 but came into force in 2019, was the CPTPP. The TPP without the United States. And we are pressing to get that ratified quickly and make sure that, that companies can benefit from this. So we are seeing opportunities in the way we have to deal with these issues, but there are also the challenges that we deal with US-China trade relations. It has a very direct impact on the Singapore economy. We're seeing some trade slowing down because of the electronics trade. And by that, these are issues that we'll have to manage working with our partners, working with the WTO, and working around the region. Thank you, Ambassador. Before I turn it over to Ambassador Banks, I'd be remiss if I didn't say we lost a great friend um, this weekend in Ambassador uh, Moore. 
Um, Mike Moore was just an incredible individual, and on a very personal level, I was one of the junior negotiators at USTR um, at, and doing the negotiations in the WTO on China's entry into the WTO. And um, I, I will never forget Ambassador Moore and what a great leader he was. He was one of those individuals who brought countries together, who found ways to navigate some of the most difficult issues. And I think, um, you know, he's a real representative of that great leadership role that um, New Zealand always seems to take in so many different levels. And Ambassador Banks, you're, you're um, no different in that regard. Um, and I will say Singapore and New Zealand have always been kind of on that vanguard, trying to be leaders on a range of different issues, being champions of the WTO, trying to forge, uh, you know, paths forward. And, um, and we're always grateful for that leadership that your country plays and that the strong individuals that you advance uh, to represent in trade negotiations always play. Um, I wanted to turn to you just because we've touched on it, you know, with uh, in the leadership role that you all took with the P4 that then became the TPP and now the CPTPP and TP11, all the different names that it has. Um, you know, it's, uh, it was an avenue that New Zealand was advancing to try to, in many ways, strengthen its relationship t uh, with the United States. But now there's been different paths that have been pursued. How do you see the U.S. relationship now, and what are the interests that you're trying to advance from a trade perspective? And I will say it up front, I have always been a champion for uh, trying to find a way to broker a stronger trading relationship between the United States and New Zealand from the very first days when I was involved with the U.S.-Australia agreement. It just makes sense, um, but maybe it's, it's time isn't right now, but hopefully it's time will come. So I'd love to turn it over to you for your thoughts on that. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you to you and others who've spoken today in uh, tribute to Mike Moore. There was certainly no stronger voice for open trade than his, and it seems timely, therefore, to be having this discussion. To come to your question, we did some research recently about the uh, relationship, trade and economic relationship, between New Zealand and the US, and we found, actually to our own surprise, that the first time we had asked for a reciprocal trade agreement was actually in September 1939. Oh, and wow. as our minister has commented recently, good things take a long time, but you know we do think 80 years is a little excessive. So <laughs> we're hoping that everybody in this room is going to be like Laura, a champion for us uh, having an even wider open door to this economy and future, which we're certainly hoping for. I just backtrack a little bit into New Zealand trade policy directions. Over the last 25 years, we have worked really hard to negotiate comprehensive and high quality bilateral agreements. We've worked equally hard to embed the New Zealand economy in the Asia Pacific architecture, and we've been very grateful for the friendship and support all the way along of Singapore. And thirdly, we've done our level best to keep that set of global trading rules strong that Ambassador Zalik and Ambassador Mukuru have have spoken about. And all of that worked really well for us for a long time, but you know now we're very uh, discomforted by the fact that we can't take a lot of those assumptions that underpinned our former tri three-pronged uh, trade policy. We can't take those for granted. And the response that we've been making is really to put even more emphasis on our what we call our open plurilateralism approach. Ambassador Mapuri already mentioned the, the way that our initial initiative, the, the E4, ended up morphing into the CPTPP, and our latest uh, initiative as well being the, the, the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, I think it's, it is really important what Ambassador Zolik stressed about the gap in our systems now for a place to negotiate new rules and new norms for trade, which is very, very different, obviously, than it was in 1995 when the WTO was set up. We still uh, put a lot of value on the kind of non-binding exploratory discussions that we can have in forums like the OECD and, and APEC. And as the APEC chair in 2021, New Zealand will look forward to 
working on a, a work program to take forward the vision for the next 20 years that will be agreed in APEC hopefully this year. But all those things, while important for encouraging the open trade and investment that we as a, a very open and smaller economy depend on, it's important, but we also really need the multilateral. And so to come back to the, the discussion earlier about the WTO and its future, we recognise the need for the updating. I think we all recognise that. And New Zealand will be an active part of the Ottawa Group discussion. But we are concerned about the fact that despite the best efforts of our one of our best uh, diplomatic negotiators on the trade front, David Walker, in, in Geneva, we still don't have a solution to the impasse over the WTO appellate body. And that is, for a, a trade rules dependent country like New Zealand, a concern. So we hope for that uh, to, to make progress in future. I just, uh, not to take too much of the time available, but I just come back to a question that was asked at the end of Ambassador Zalek's session about how do you explain the benefits of international trade out in the community? We've just done a very interesting exercise on that in New Zealand over the last 18 months or so. Called, we called it the Trade for All Initiative. Mm -hmm. And it involved a countrywide consultation. And the purpose was to really listen to what people in the community, not just the business community, but women, Maori, uh, Pacific people, everybody, small businesses, what they had to say about what they wanted from trade policy and where they thought it should go in future. Now, while we are blessed with a fairly widespread understanding in the community of the benefits of international trade and the extent to which our economy is dependent on it, this consultation also showed up that there was quite a divided opinion in the community as to whether what we're doing at the moment is the right thing or whether we actually need to shift course to bring our trade policy into closer alignment with the values and the priorities of New Zealanders. And that means, really, uh, sustainability in terms of both the environment and social sustainability and making sure that the benefits are experienced by everybody, including women. And I know women's economic empowerment is something that Laura is, is a great champion of and driving hard for. And we certainly support that too, whether it be through APEC or, or in our own domestic context. So I'll leave it there, happy to answer questions later. Thank you, time. Ambassador Banks. Um, I want to turn to Ambassador Arroyo. I have to tell you, I, um, I, I, I currently serve as the co-chair of the President's Advisory Council for Doing Business in Africa. And uh, last year, our delegation traveled to Ethiopia, and it was palpable, a lot of the reforms that the Prime Minister was advancing, particularly accelerating Ethiopia's accession to the WTO. But you all also play a pivotal role on the African subcontinent in terms of leading the African Union, and how exciting that we finally have a continental free trade agreement among all the African countries, really propelling economies to realizing the synergies and the benefits of trading with one another. And so in that context, Ethiopia has a full agenda in terms of joining the multilateral trading system, advancing regional economic integration through free trade agreements. With that really robust agenda, how do you see the relationship with the United States and how, um, what are the priorities that you're trying to advance to support those other two important pillars in terms of strengthening the Ethiopian economy? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, Ethiopia has been uh, growing in the last uh, 15 years, double digit, uh, fueled mainly because of uh, public investment, uh, both in economic and social infrastructure, uh, preparing itself for uh, preparing educated workforce as well as infrastructure, power, you know, the biggest power plant uh, in Africa is now uh, being uh, developed in Ethiopia, uh, Great Renaissance Dam, we call it financed fully by uh, Ethiopian uh, four billion US dollar uh, project and railway, uh, so many other infrastructure is also going on to prepare ourselves for uh, the coming uh, big I mean, uh, expectation 
we believe Africa is, an, is the next uh, frontier for businesses, for investment and trade, because 1.3, I mean, uh, 3 trillion economy at the moment with 1.3 billion population uh, cannot be left uh, as it is. We really seek huge investment in, in, in many, many ways. So private sectors should get a better opportunity. Uh, we have to reform a lot to attract uh, to do business and uh, investment as well. Ethiopia, ha uh, after growing uh, that much, uh, had a challenge two years ago. Uh, a population with more than 110 million, the second largest in Africa. The youth population is more than 70%. You can imagine the pressure. So the growth cannot match with the growing population and needs of the people. And angry youth uh, wanted to change and. Uh, the former prime minister resigned, and we have a new prime minister who is reaching out uh, to be more inclusive, uh, reached out to the neighboring countries, and uh, managed to uh, win the minds and hearts of the people in the region. Uh, as you may remember, 2019, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts at home and in the region. Uh, and he also is advancing uh, economic uh, uh, I mean reforms as well. He has what he called homegrown economic uh, reform program, launched uh, a year ago, which is m mainly to uh, help more private sectors to be attracted uh, by uh, improving the World Bank ease of doing business initiative by one hand, and also acceding to the World uh, Trade Organization. Uh, after eight years, he ha has made it a priority to work on WTO, and it was last week that uh, one of the key meetings has been happened. Uh, and we hope by 2021 uh, we'll be acceding to WTO. That's what uh, his priority is also about. And also, uh, AGOA has been uh, very instrumental for us, uh, support coming from US for uh, qualified African countries uh, to export more than 2,600 goods to US market duty free quota free it's a big privilege uh, we had very uh, limited market access uh, but because of agoa just to give you one figure uh, we had uh, 40 million dollars export to US because of its uh, remoteness logistics costs uh, but uh, just uh, within uh, 4 years uh, it grew sixfold uh, and also, as government, what we did was uh, companies like PVH, the Kavli Klein brand owner, Tommy Hefinger and others, they believe in long-term uh, partnership rather than window shopping. Mm -hmm. So they thought Ethiopia is preparing itself for coming generation. And partnering with them, we managed to build the biggest industrial park in the country uh, with 43 factories each as big as a football stadium. Now that's completed and more than 30,000 employees are, are being employed. And most of the products are textile, footwear, uh, garments, export to US and European market. So we, we are really uh, happy to uh, partner with such companies. And uh, now Ethiopia is the most uh, exporting country in terms of footwear to uh, US from all African countries. But the potential is so huge. It's, yeah, it's not yet ta you know, tapped. Uh, we have many opportunities, comparative advantages uh, in terms of labor cost, one of the lowest power uh, is also one of the cheapest in the world. I can say renewable, environment friendly. We uh, generate close to 90% or 95% from hydro, wind, and uh, solar and continue to uh, advance on that uh, line. So uh, the other thing which is coming uh, as a wonderful opportunity is the African uh, Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. which already uh, 54 countries out of 55 AU members signed and will be starting, I think, uh, July this year. Uh, what this means is that uh, Africa has never uh, transacted each other because of the barriers in each country the tariffs and the non-tariff barriers. Uh, so AU has decided and uh, now all African countries are joining, 30 already ratified. 
so it be no by uh, July uh, 2020. Uh, so uh, African countries at the moment export close to 70% extractive industries, oil, uh, minerals, but we have huge agricultural products and exporting it raw. We can process it there. Ethiopia is investing, I mean, importing close to a billion dollar edible oil where we export system feed uh, and niches and others uh, raw uh, feed. So we have huge opportunity to attract agro processing, uh, textile and garment, footwear, labor intensive industries, electronics, cut flour, w the biggest cut flour uh, company in the world is in Ethiopia at the moment, a Dutch company. So we would like to encourage companies, especially US companies, because they know the market. They know the, requirement, the regulatory requirements when they import it. They know their customers better uh, to invest in this market and uh, work you know, in partnership. Uh, I believe it's high time to consider Africa. <coughs> uh, every time you see how the digital uh, penetration is growing in Africa, uh, creating more opportunity uh, for, for businesses. Thank I you. want you to know we totally share that excitement and I think the President's Advisory Council is really trying to um, help companies recognize the opportunities that exist on the continent as well as strengthening the tools that companies have for being able to engage because we need to have a strong XM bank, need to have strong OPIC financing, all the access to guarantees um, and uh, the support of the U.S. government in terms of growing in the continent. and um, and so. Um, I will make sure we continue to keep that excitement up because the opportunity is there, just as you indicated. Yes, there is a DFC fund already uh, released uh, this year, uh, which is a bipartisan uh, dual tax mm -hmm. establishment. I think they have allocated 60 billion US dollars for de risking and financing and investing jointly, uh, much of which they say it would go to. Uh, to Africa. So we hope that will help a lot uh, to, you know, uh, I mean, invest more. And uh, uh, there are some arguments that China is investing hugely to Africa, but not really the case. Uh, I think it's not too late to consider this investment. China differs from US. They had, they have still have uh, an instrument to finance. They have Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which they also back with some Exim Bank funding, other funding. So, so far, U.S. didn't have anything too much with. I think this is a great opportunity for businesses to use. I agree. So, Ambassador Mbembas, I was going to say I, it's not last and not least. You are the newest to the Washington, D.C. Diplomatic Corps. You've been here a year, and what a powerful voice you've been. Um, and I have to say, the uh, uh, start of 2020 was a little bit more encouraging for me after um, President Trump and um, uh, EU head uh, von der Leyen met. And we've been hearing a lot more encouraging talk about the possibility of addressing some of the tensions that have been an undercurrent in the EU-US relationship. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you see on the horizon? Um, you're in a room of people who I think believe in the transatlantic uh, uh, business relationship and the power of the partnership, but we need to also see that translated into policy outcomes. And so I'm just curious, um, can we believe in a little bit of that optimism that we're starting to hear that there is prospects for resolving some issues and putting us on a positive trajectory for 2020? Uh, yes, I mean, you can believe, certainly. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, and that's what we're working very hard on. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you mentioned, that meeting was, uh, was uh, very um, successful. They had a very good understanding of the importance of promoting the trade relationship uh, and of finding it a, a, a sort of a positive agenda for it as well. Many times when we talk about the trade relationship between Europe and the U.S., the two sort of big, uh, biggest, freest markets in the world, um, the, uh, we focus on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the few irritants, and there are irritants on both sides, and, uh, and sometimes those, those tend to make the, the headlines. But in fact, I think 
uh, also jumping into what Zerbik said in the end of his of his speech, if you if you if you look at the benefits of this relationship, they are daily and they are remarkable, uh, and um, and they're indicative, in fact, of how free trade actually can work in a globalized system, and can, in many instances, in fact, not leave people behind. And if it does, then it's quite important to find a way to protect them. Something that maybe in Europe we uh, we are more conscious of and try to do a, a, a better job at than 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 maybe here in the states for a number of reasons, but. 58% of all U.S. investment abroad goes to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, that tells you something about how open and big this market is. 70% uh, of all foreign direct investment in this country, in the United States, comes from European companies. This hasn't happened in spite of the fact that there are 27 EU member states united together in the single market. It's happened because of it. The single market is, in fact, uh, the biggest deregulation experiment in the world. We uh, essentially trashed 20 even 27 independent laws and regulations of 27 independent countries, uh, and we put in their place one single set of regulations that allowed us now to have a, a, an open market without borders of uh, 400, 450 of million of the most uh, prosperous citizens in the world. That is the attraction, uh, and that is what we are trying to focus on. Now, yes, there are irritants. Um, you should be hopeful. I think we are very serious about having a discussion with the United States about building on the win-win relationship that we have already and, and ad addressing some of them. But also, Laura, here's the key thing. We have to focus on the future because, indeed, there are opportunity costs in just focusing on the irritants. Um, three or four priorities on our side, just very quickly. One, um, we are open for business and we'll continue being open for business. Uh, the European Union today has um, agreements, uh, 30, 41 trade agreements with 72 countries around the world. Um, we are the, uh, and we have the, uh, the most comprehensive trade network in the whole world. Um, we, uh, 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 recent successes include uh, uh, agreements with Japan, with Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, and we, uh, we very much look forward to completing agreements underway with New Zealand uh, and uh, with Australia, uh, Chile, Mexico, etc. Uh, so, uh, these agreements have real benefits for both sides. Uh, and when it comes to virtually every country in the world, certainly with the U.S., we focus on the local. We do go down to the grassroots. We do talk to companies. We do talk to workers. And they know why it benefits them. And this is what has actually managed, in our view, uh, to, uh, in spite of all the uh, tensions recently, to keep the um, uh, relative peace in the transatlantic relationship because people get it. Mm -hmm. especially when you go down to the grassroots and you show it. Second thing that we do uh, is that we have a progressive values-based trade policy. This is a big deal, okay? Trade is not about simply um, making money. It is about making money. It's not just about shipping containers. It is about shipping containers. But those containers and those containers, you don't just simply put goods. You also put values. And we must never forget that, and we in Europe do not. Uh, people don't understand, you take GSP+, Plus, the biggest, freest access that we give to the EU uh, market. Um, GSP+, Plus agreements are with countries whose only obligation in order to, uh, to, to, to receive that benefit is to commit to and be monitored to apply all international human rights and labor rights agreements. That's it. We don't tell people, oh, you know, we'll buy your oranges if you buy our peaches, we tell them your oranges can come in duty-free in the EU so long as you ensure that women's rights are protected, mm -hmm. you ensure that labor rights are protected, you ensure that there is free speech. This is huge, especially at a time that in the world today, the battle that we have is not so much one of uh, eco different economic philosophies or trade philosophies, although we have that as well, but it's also a values battle. Mm -hmm. And we have to be prepared also through a trade policy to do this. There's a new leadership of the European Commission in place in Brussels. It has placed major emphasis on uh, a, the challenge of climate change and the new growth strategy of Europe, which is the green growth strategy, uh, focusing on the environment, focusing on, uh, on all these technologies and innovations that will take us there. Um, this is something we'll be supporting countries around the world to, uh, to work with us as well. Privacy, mm -hmm. major issue. We do bring in a trades agreements issues such as privacy uh, and data protection. 
these are big deal things. They also connect to the digital world, which is another big um, uh, priority. Okay, uh, third point, uh, rules-based approach, and let me close with this. Um, someone said, I forget, I forget who, maybe the ambassador from, from Singapore, that, that uh, it is smaller countries that want the rule-based approach. Well, we are a big elephant in this room, and we are the biggest, most fanatic supporter of a rules-based approach. We absolutely, positively do not like and do not support unilateral efforts to destroy the WTO in the international trading system. We do not want might is right international trade. We, we went through that as a world. We saw the consequences. It's not the way to go. And we will work with our partners to stop that trend. We do understand that it's not easy to stop. There are broader issues, a, a, an anti-globalization uh, strands and mercantilistic, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, approach in uh, in countries that in the past were not um, uh, in that uh, in that camp, but now appear to be. But in the end of the day, and this is a message we send to everyone, is that the WTO has to become stronger and better. It cannot stay as it is. Mm -hmm. It is a humongous mistake for anyone to try to throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm -hmm. and this is what sometimes uh, we feel is happening, including in the U.S. discussion. Uh, but it is absolutely important and fundamental to try to turn the, to put the rules. In order to have a rules-based system, you also need to have rules that are uh, consistent with today's world. Uh, industrial subsidies cannot be ignored by the WTO, and I'm very pleased to say that in our trilateral discussions with Japan mm -hmm. and with the United States very recently, when Commissioner Hogan was here, um, there was a uh, an agreement uh, to promote uh, a, a very uh, concrete. Uh, framework with our allies around the world to ensure WTO rules reflect um, the, uh, you know, new industrial subsidy um, uh, principles. Um, but um, I assure you that we will be standing <coughs> there uh, in the world system and with our U.S. friends, uh, from which we hope to have very concrete proposals on how, for example, they would like to see the appellate body to improve. It's one thing to say that you want it to improve. We certainly agree. Uh, we need to work on concrete proposals. We need to get uh, the, the support of countries, and we need to move forward, and that's what we're going to be doing. So open for business, um, progressive, uh, values-based uh, trade uh, that is beneficial to all, um, and a multilateral system that works. Uh, fundamentally, these are our priorities. Thank you. I, I want to touch on that because we, um, we've heard a lot today about the importance of strengthening international institutions and really shoring up the rules-based system. Um, we heard from uh, Director General Acevedo today about um, the future of the WTO and the role it needs to play. And, and, and I want to start with you, Ambassador Banks, and, and then ask each of the panelists to give their thoughts. There are important reforms that need to happen, and I will share with you on a very personal level. I was one of the negotiators at the Singapore Ministerial when we were talking uh, back then about the needs for reform of the dispute settlement process, that there were aspects of it that needed to be changed. Um, since then, we've learned that there's a lot of rules that are still needed. I mean, you touched on industrial subsidies. I would throw in there, we need uh, subsidies protection against services. With a lot of our economies being services-based, why stop at just industrial subsidies? There really needs to be disciplining of state-owned enterprises operating in the global uh, trading system and distorting trade. And so from that perspective, there's a lot of areas that the WTO could be strengthened. We've heard from African countries about the need to have more of a development agenda. I'm just curious about some of the ideas beyond um, the, the headlines that we've been talking about, about reforming the dispute settlement process. How can we make the WTO the institution it needs to be going forward? And I will preface all of that by saying I was a little bit concerned myself um, hearing some of the rhetoric coming out of the U.S. government that suggested that the, the WTO was um, going to be blown up. I think uh, at Davos we heard a very different message about the importance of reforming. But reform requires dialogue and it requires good exchanges of ideas. We've touched on some that have already happened. What other ways would you reform the WTO specifically to bring it more into this century and I'd say make the next decade the decade of real opportunity through global engagement? Well, I think the, the first challenge of 
reforming any multilateral organization. And in my past career, I had some not terribly uplifting experience of trying to re do reform at the United Nations in New York. Mm -hmm. But the first uh, challenge is really to have absolute commitment from the major players at a political level. You can bring all of the technical expertise and all of the diplomatic experience you like to the table, but unless the main, the main driving forces in that organisation want reform, then it's going to be an uphill struggle. We've heard uh, that the EU is certainly fully in, in support of, of reforming the WTO, and I think perhaps we can hope that a majority of its members uh, would get behind that, but we somehow don't yet have that little magic initial movement that gives people confidence that, yes, we can go forward, we can actually pick up these, these empty spaces of whether it's data or digital or subsidies that need to be uh, collected, uh, need to be um, gripped up. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I wish I had an answer. Uh, <laughs> my colleague David Walker is actually going to be uh, here for another conference over the next two days. So unfortunately, you've asked me the question before he's arrived. I would have been much better equipped to answer <laughs> it after he's been here. I hope he's got some very good ideas to share with us. New, Ze New Zealand always has great ideas, so I'm <laughs> confident we're going to get some good ideas as well. I, um, beyond industrial subsidies, I'm going to ask you the question, which maybe is a little bit uncomfortable, but the, the elephant in the room is, when we brought China into the WTO, it was very much a country that needed to be part of the international trading system and to be um, to have its economy governed by um, shared rules, shared values. Um, but I would argue that the China we have today is no no longer needs that special treatment as a developing economy. It's a powerhouse now. I think that's one area that the WTO does need to reform is its definitions um, in terms of what countries get special and differential treatment and which ones don't. I'm curious if the EU has been thinking about ideas in this regard because I think that this administration is hitting on a legitimate issue in terms of how ensuring that the rules um, are beneficial to countries on the basis of where they stand in their development paradigm and not necessarily being gamed to st uh, distort competition in the global marketplace. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that in particular. Well, I think, um, I think the issue of rights and obligations of dis different countries in the WTO is one area of reform. Um, the vast majority of countries in WTO today are considered to be emerging economies. That's sim just simply not true. I suppose we can all agree today in this room that China has emerged. Uh, it is not emerging. Uh, and uh, therefore, this is clearly an area that has to be worked on. Um, transparency is another area uh, that needs to be worked on, including notifications uh, and other issues, and making sure that countries do notify as they're supposed to under the present rules. Um, uh, and of course, you have the, the appellate body. But I underline again, and I want to make this point very clear. Uh, it is very s easy and, and very important, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's easy relatively to, to identify issues you need to reform. Uh, but uh, it's very diff a different thing to, to, to work hard to achieve the political consensus mm -hmm. in negotiation to reform and to instead actually try to create parallel um, uh, unilateral um, uh, trading mechanisms, ignoring WTO, uh, while claiming at the same time that you really care for it. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is that WTO, uh, the international trade system, is in danger. The more um, different countries feel that they are big enough to, to, to try to do their own thing, is actually in danger of collapsing, even if deep down no one really wants it to collapse. So as we proceed to reforms, we have to be very careful to ensure WTO can work. The dispute settlement mechanism is a classic example. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a multilateral trading system without having a referee, one that can be trusted. If you get rid of a referee, you're in an entirely different place. You can have as many rules as you want on the table, but at the end of the day, if, you know, I'll decide what, what you've done wrong because I'm the EU and I'm big and strong. And I can beat you on the head. Uh, and if you don't like it, well, that's too bad. And that, of course, creates an international system that is so unstable 
especially in today's world where everything is so interrelated, including supply chains and everything else, then it always comes back to bite you. It mm -hmm. always comes back to bite you in the end. It's what Zolik was saying. It's, uh, again, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point things do accumulate. So we have to change it, but we have to be committed to doing it together in cooperation with, with world countries. China. My belief is that it, you know, China wants to play big. It's a big country, has emerged. It's got to play a bigger role in um, not just demanding rights, but also exercising responsibilities under the international system. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means it's got to take an active role in also accepting obligations. Uh, China needs a WTO. It certainly has been very beneficial for it. Um, uh, and, uh, and I believe that it is um, in China's interests, and we can uh, have this conversation. We're having it already as the EU, as we're negotiating now with China an investment agreement. Everything from uh, industrial subsidies and, uh, and uh, forced technology transfers and other things are things we're discussing. Um, working together with the United States on this issue, including on China, is something we need to do. Being divided, because sometimes we even fight on issues that are simply ridiculously small when you look at the forest, mm -hmm. uh, is dividing and conquering us when we should be united all together in this panel around the world you know, focusing on the on the big prize. So that's my job here to try to to convince everyone uh, that that's where we should be going. So good luck to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good luck to all of yeah. us. Yeah. And I was going to say, Ambassador Orega, I swear, joining the WTO is in Ethiopia's interests <laughs> as we're talking about you know concerns about reform. Um, as a true believer in the WTO and the rules-based trading system, we know it's going to bring a lot of benefits. We've seen it transform countries and strengthen their rules, not because they have, um, how should I say, uh, acceded to others' rules. It's strengthened domestic economies. We've seen it time and time again, and every WTO member that has um, used the rules to strengthen their domestic economies. Um, I'm just curious, just quickly, to touch on, you know, uh, how do you see your accession negotiations proceeding? Are there, um, are there issues where additional support I is needed to shore up the domestic constituency to support um, Ethiopia joining? Because I know it's been a long negotiation, um, but uh, I'm excited about the fact that the Prime Minister has made it a priority. And so if you can just touch on um, why you know, Ethiopia still sees that tremendous value in areas that we can support you on. Thank you. Uh, I think in the past uh, there were some concerns uh, from the government uh, in the previous administration joining, uh, you know, bringing uh, a better uh, balance of payment, uh, rather uh, get uh, lots of goods, uh, you know, uh, receive. I mean, uh, imports of a lot of good imports and uh, uh, become. I don't think that's a, a right argument. Uh, when you join, you also attract investment, uh, which also helps the balance of payment in a positive way. Uh, I think the current administration uh, understands the benefits in joining. And also, uh, there are uh, negotiating uh, arrangements uh, for countries who are acceding. Uh, it's not just uh, opening up the time you join, there are steps which you can uh, understand as you go on within that uh, accession period. So um, we believe now uh, the government is committed. Uh, it will be to the advantage of uh, the country and the people. Thank you. I, I, I've always been a firm believer that trade just lifts all boats, that helps. Uh, I mean, if you think about poverty alleviation in the world since World War II, it's come because economies have come together and traded on the basis of rules, um, you know, that uh, were part of the GATT, are now part of the WTO. And so, um, you know, I know many in the business community are cheering Ethiopia on in terms of achieving that that goal and that target of joining by 2021 because it is a powerful block to be a part of an important rules that we think have helped businesses like UPS as well as businesses in the room. Yes, we have seen, you know, when China started uh, transforming, <coughs> it's when they joined WTO. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, sometimes they take it as ideological you know thing uh, but i think uh, joining uh, in the past uh, it was argued in ethiopian case the previous uh, administration argued uh, when we don't have enough goods uh, to transact with uh, will be in a disadvantaged position uh, but that uh, argument i don't think uh, holds uh, over now mm -hmm. uh, because the same principle can attract uh, companies businesses to to do you know to produce more goods and services in the country I couldn't agree more. Mm. When I was studying at Georgetown, um, I, was, I got my master's in foreign service and economics, and one of the case studies we did was Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore mm. was that amazing transformation in terms of um, a country that uh, has now become a powerhouse in services and innovation. Um, UPS has its regional headquarters there, and there's no accident. It's because of the opportunities that exist in Singapore. Um, and uh, the kinds of rules and transparency there is to the rules. Singapore has a very important voice in the WTO discussions, and I'm just curious if you wanted to share some of the perspectives that you all are bringing on the reform agenda, but specific to a lot of the e-commerce discussions. I'm pretty excited about uh, the fact that the WTO is tackling that important set of rules because trading is done differently now. We all know that, but you need to have the rules of trade to be able to ensure that companies, uh, small and medium, all the way to the biggest players, have the right rules of the game to engage in e-commerce and digital trade. And I'm just curious if you want to share Singapore's perspective on the important negotiations underway in the WTO there and other issues that you'd sure. like to see reformed. Sure. The challenge for multilateral organizations is that they almost become frozen in the time that they're created. And nobody wants to talk about moving them forward, whether it's the UN, whether it's the WTO, and the WTO really just created two groups of countries, developed and developing. If you look back 20 years, maybe that was a short-sighted view, just to look at these two. How are we going to graduate countries? When China joined, there was this particular view. Ethiopia just coming in. So you have got the United States, the world's most powerful economy. You've got Ethiopia coming in to be able to expect them all to sort of play in that same framework. Some countries join because it gives them a political legitimacy. It's not that they want to make the economic changes. And so I think we need to understand this sort of realistic view of global multilateralism. Then what you take away, yes, you've got to work the technical details. You need to have better dispute. One reason for the WTO was to create a dispute settlement me mechanism that we didn't have previously. If that doesn't work, then what purpose does the WTO serve? So what I think where we really are looking for something is more political leadership. And it's got to be political leadership that comes from the bigger countries. Where there's, I mean, there are valid complaints that the US has made about the WTO. I mean, if I go through everything that Ambassador Lighthizer has said, he said some of the, I mean, you cannot disagree with many of the things that he said about WTO. The idea then is, do you break it or do you fix it? And putting aside the breaking option, because I don't think that's really an option, how do you fix it? Do you fix it on your own? Do you fix it by creating separate mechanisms as they've almost done a managed trade agreement with China, which created a very different framework for deal with, a bilateral framework to deal with some of these disputes rather than going back? That's one approach of dealing with it. Do you fix it by working with other partners, the EU partners, some of the other countries? Singapore's approach is we're a small economy, but we've got to be realistic about these things. So we work with the WTO to try and get this JSI going forward. But that's not the only thing we do. The same way that when we did the WTO, we did not just rely on that. We went for bilateral FTAs. Our first bilateral mm -hmm. FTA was, in fact, with New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And we now, so you have a parallel and concurrent sort of processes that say, let's work this big organization, recognizing it's going to be slow to move, recognizing that people have very different agendas of why they are there, recognizing that no one wants to move out of the grade that they are in because they feel uncomfortable about that. And then how can we create frameworks that at least point the way forward for different things to happen? So the digital economy partnership that we have with New Zealand and Chile is one way of doing that. Can others come and join that, move up there because they're ready to move? Will, will that create some 
uh, speed in terms of the JSI, that's what we hope can, it can be done. But you've got to look at these things almost in a real, realistic point of view, rather than just focusing on that the, we've got to fix technical bits in there. And really that political leadership is, I think, the most important thing that we need to look for. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I want to touch on the China question, and before I do, my weekend was consumed with um, figuring out ways to keep our planes flying in and out. Um, we are obviously very involved in ensuring that UPS flights continue to um, get into China, particularly for distributing um, life-saving healthcare products. Um, and, um, and so uh, I'm going to preface everything that I'm about to say by saying we stand with the people of China and, um, uh, and, uh, and the challenges that they're going through. Um, and we want to be partners with them. UPS has been a proud um, logistics supplier in the Chinese market, and we will continue to be. And as someone who has been um, on the negotiating table with the Chinese, bringing them into the WTO, I think the global economy is stronger because China is part of this system. But there are challenges that we've all touched on. And um, uh, the U.S. Uh, had its approach with the phase one agreement, and um, I, I, I leave the characterization to how you said it, that it's more of a managed trade agreement. I actually am a big believer in we have to find ways to address some of the issues that many of our companies have in the Chinese market. But how do we do that? Um, uh, the WTO has not been uh, a forum in the context of which we've been able to address, address some of those issues. But are there other ways um, that we can help address some of the intellectual property right challenges, creating more of those rules? Um, I, I could answer the question, I think, myself by saying stronger together. Um, I know and when we brought uh, China into the WTO, I spent many a days at the China New World Hotel um, uh, passing off information between the EU trade negotiating team and, and our team uh, in the consecutive rounds to make sure we were able to achieve the best outcomes for both of our companies. Wait a second. I thought it was just we looked each other in the eye. And no, <laughs> no, no, no. We actually, we okay, actually. So you played a role in this. We had some okay. beers. We figured it out. We said, okay, what next? It's not a um, <laughs> but, yeah. but what can we do to address some of these challenges? How do we make it more in China's interest to see the strength of these values that we have? particularly the rules for trade. Um, I, I know uh, Ambassador Banks uh, New Zealand has a free trade agreement with uh, China. Um, and, uh, and how are the discussions that you all are having with them, setting aside right now the, the appropriate focus on addressing and supporting um, you know, China in terms of addressing the coronavirus, but on the trade relationship? Um, how have your discussions been going? And, and I'd ask maybe um, Ambassador Lembridis and, uh, and Ambassador McCory to talk about ways in which you've engaged China, and then, um, and then I'll come back to Ambassador Lega. Yes, New Zealand was actually the first developed country to agree a free trade agreement with China back in 2008, and we've just actually reviewed and updated it in the last, within the last few months. But in terms of you know, our experience, our experience has actually been probably atypical because of the trade profile. We're largely in commodity items. Uh, we're not so much exposed in the way that the US and other economies like the EU are in terms of intellectual property, transfer of technology, etc. So we've probably had fewer of those problems up till now. I mean, we share the concerns uh, about somehow uh, working together to, to get increased pressure on China to abide by its own WTO commitments. But in terms of our sort of our national experience, we've been rather sheltered from that, just as I say, simply by the nature of the trade. Mm -hmm. But you've established important disciplines that I think were a building block for subsequent discussions. I know, mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador Lembridis, you have uh, a, a investment treaty negotiations, 26th round that you're going through. Um, and what I've found in the discussions with the Chinese is if it's in their domestic interests, oftentimes they see the value of that exchange. How have those been dis discussions been going, and do you see other opportunities for strengthening the rules 
of engagement with China in a way that has positive outcomes for China and the EU, the US, and the global training system? Well, on a, on, on a very simple level, right, China, when China sees an economic advantage in, uh, in others uh, investing in its own economy, then, uh, then it is much more open in finding compromise on how to ensure that investment can happen and, uh, and flourish. Uh, and so when we discuss with China in the investment agreement, uh, we begin from the basic reality and assumption that China sees European investment as extremely important to its economy. And in that context, we also make clear that if European companies cannot have the access or the protection of the Chinese economy uh, that, um, uh, that uh, we desire, then it will be very difficult for us to not reciprocally ensure that China cannot have um, uh, higher access to the European market. So we are working very hard also looking at our trade defense instruments, uh, uh, investment screening instruments, and all these things. Um, this is the kind of discussion that is based, if you like, on economic fundamentals that China is beginning to understand more because it's beginning to become a more sophisticated economy, not just one that produces cheap things to export to others, but one that aspires to, um, you know, to go from, um, you know, produced in China to made, uh, to from made in China to, uh, to designed in China and to, uh, and, and all these things require that kind of cross-pollination, right, of, of, of businesses. And so we see that there. When it comes to uh, values, um, it's more complicated. China clearly does not share many of the values uh, that, uh, that uh, we share and we believe are fundamental and that, as, as I said before, we tend to be exporting with, uh, with trade as well. So China um, has tried to export some of its values with its, with its uh, trade and that has been quite problematic. We've seen this in, uh, in a, a number of parts of the world where the Belt and Road Initiative was also used to piggyback uh, very poor governance values, human rights values, and stuff like that. What I find interesting, um, but I am not really an expert in this, so I have to be careful, is that um, in some ways uh, China has been uh, itself shocked and maybe is readjusting its course by looking at the results of some of its initial attempts to, um, to promote that kind of value-less investment. There have been countries, including in Africa, and the ambassador can, can uh, alluded to that before, um, that in fact are standing up and are saying, wait a second, I don't want to have the kind of investment that takes hostage my, um, you know, my mines and my ports or uh, that uh, brings thousands of people from the outside to be working but not my people inside and, um, or maybe creates corruption. Uh, and I think that China, looking at this, is also adjusting course. So it's not just a matter of, uh, although it's very important of having uh, the, the coalitions and the alliances to ensure that we can, in fact, persuade China uh, to change, but it's also a, a matter of uh, allowing uh, the processes of world peoples who do not aspire to be controlled, in addition to simply becoming a little richer with better investments, controlled, uh, standing up. And finally, I would say, China itself is changing a lot. The, the intellectual property discussions we're having, we couldn't have a few years ago because a few years ago, Chinese companies were not stealing international property from other Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you have a lot of that happening. Um, you also, uh, and in that sense, you have a system and an economy and a government that is beginning to realize that many of the things that we were talking about for a long time and that we're resisting uh, are, are much more in China's uh, interest and its people are also demanding them. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see. It's a long road ahead, but the more united we are in this, the more effective we will be. Yeah. Ambassador Rafari? Uh, with, with China, let me talk a little bit bigger about the region of Southeast Asia because China has emerged as the number one trading partner of every Southeast Asian country. Singapore has a bilateral FTA with China. ASEAN has got an FTA with China. China is part of the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So we're trying to make sure that there is a better connectivity between countries of Southeast Asia and China. Singapore is the largest foreign investor in China. So we have a lot of stake in what's happening in China. 
you know, we're starting to see that China is also interested in IP protection. They are starting to talk about sustainability and transparency in their Belt and Road projects. And these are important conversations to have. What Singapore has done in particular with China, we, we were a small economy relative to China. When you look at a city like Wuhan that has got this, uh, sadly, is the hub of this virus, they have more pe they have twice as many people there than in Singapore, just one city. So, you know, just think of that scale of the country. But we have worked with them, particularly in government-to-government -government projects in three different ways. We started with industrialization, created a model industrial park in, Sing in China, in Suzhou, and that became a model for other Chinese cities to see how they want to industrialize. Then we created an eco-city just outside Beijing that looked at environmental technologies that Chinese cities, as they urbanize, could use. Now we're looking at connectivity and services. So really moving up where China sees a value in terms of its partnership with Singapore and with the other Southeast Asian countries as well. I think that's one way that we feel that we can bring some value to this relationship, but also show a direction in which the Chinese economy needs to transform. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to one last question because I know we're out of time. And it's one that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, I think trade needs to be more inclusive. And when I look at the world, 50% of the world's population is women. And many of them do not realize the benefits of a lot of the amazing trade agreements that are out there. Many can't own property in their names. They can't open a bank account, can't apply for a loan. They can't travel freely within their country. They can't cross borders. How do you run a business if you can't uh, achieve those five fundamental elements when there's discrimination against women around the world? I know I have three he for she ambassadors right here, and Ambassador Banks is right there with us in terms of championing changes we need in the trade regime to eliminate discrimination against women. It's the hundredth year of the women getting the right to vote in this country. And you know what? It's about time on the global stage that women get the opportunity without restrictions, without their hands tied behind their back, being able to engage in trade. We are big champions of trying to advance an initiative within the WTO to say to all member countries, every, every commitment that you've undertaken should be done gender neutral doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman or wh however um, you identify. There should not be discrimination on the basis of gender. Women should not continue to be discriminated against. And I'm curious just maybe in the one thing that we can do from your country's perspectives to advance that initiative, um, if you had one thing that we could do in Geneva to achieve that not a year from now, but at the next WTO ministerial, what will it take, Ambassador Banks? And then we'll just go down quickly down the panel. Um, what can we do? Because I promise you, you say it, we will do it. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, but um, unfortunately, I'm not in Geneva. I'm in Washington, and I haven't had any direct contact with WTO discussions for quite some time. So. I am embarrassed to have to kick the touch on this question, but I'm afraid I'm going to. We are fully behind the objective. But I think you gave the answer. We need to move the needle in Geneva, because if the WTO ambassadors can agree and send messages back to capitals, then maybe we can move the world. Well, I would say uh, what we have begun doing, I told you before that, that human rights is a, is a fundamental element of all our trade agreements in the past years, uh, and that includes women's rights. Mm. Um, we have begun to also, uh, at the EU level, do uh, impact assessments, gender-based impact assessments of agre trade agreements mm -hmm. before we sign them, which is to say we try to look at what the effect of those agreements would be, directly or indirectly, to the goal of, of, of gender equality. Uh, so this is something that before you even go to the WTO level you can do if you're the European Union and you're as committed as we are to what I said before, a progressive values-based trade. Finally, I would say in some ways you shouldn't be expecting a trade agreement uh, to be in itself um, addressing the root causes of the problem of inequality. Uh, it can, be, can be perhaps uh, address some symptoms. But the root cause has to be addressed fundamentally, and that is where I'm particularly proud as a European, mm -hmm. that the European Union is placing all its might and all its money uh, behind 
ensuring gender equality in the world. Just to give you um, an example, uh, 500 uh, million euros have been dedicated through the United Nations to the so-called Spotlight Initiative two years ago. It's ongoing around the world to eliminate violence against women um, and girls. Now, you know what? Um, things like uh, female genital mutilation and cutting, violence against women, early and forced marriages, these are not just human rights crimes, quote-unquote, in and of themselves. They have tremendous impact on the ability of women afterwards to be empowered in society. Laura, can I just close with this? Because I used to run the Human Rights for the European Union before I took this job. I used to go to governments that suppress rights around the world uh, on, on, on a regular basis. And very often, when every other argument of theirs failed, would, they would turn to me and tell me, Mr. Lambrinidis, look at, I mean, we, we, you know, we are fighting terrorism here. We have some real issues, security and others. And you're coming talking about rights and women's rights and all these things. Give us a break. There's some real challenges here, and you are like the first world telling us what to do. And I would, and I would answer that with a question. I'd say, okay, tell me, what's so scary about smart girls? Why did Boko Haram in Nigeria abduct 300 girls from school instead of, you know, bombing one more army barracks that they're good at? And, you know, why did the Taliban, you know, plant a bullet in Malala Yousafzai's head? And, and why did ISIS in Iraq, um, you know, abduct and forcibly marry and rape, you know, hundreds of Yazidi girls? What's so scary about smart girls? And the answer is very clear to us, smart girls tend to become educated girls, and then they tend to become empowered women, and empowered women change entirely the balance of power in any society, and the last thing that a terrorist wants is empowered society. They want societies with big black holes of power that they can fill in with their hatred, and they can fill in with their violence. So you know what? You want to fight terrorists? Get the guns in place, fine. But educate girls and boys if you're serious about it. So these things are not soft foreign policy. Educating girls is not soft. It's hard. And we've got to do it, and we're doing it. And, and we're doing it with as many partners in the world as we can. You know what? I, I believe that deserves a clap. And, and I don't want that to be the last word, but that was powerful because I am a big believer in little girls with big dreams become women of great vision. And may we all be empowered by great men like you saying exactly that. I, I, I want to give the last two ambassadors. I know I, know I believe in on-time delivery, too, but <laughs> these are two great ambassadors, too, that I, I want to them to have the, uh, an additional say. So, Thank you. Uh, our prime minister currently... Uh, uh, 50 percent women as his cabinet member yes, I know. That's and so uh, we have uh, the first uh, I mean the women president at the moment uh, he believes in having uh, women empowered <coughs> in the right place and most of the investment coming to Ethiopia uh, with labor intensive industries have been employing close to 80 percent women because of uh, the will of the leader but when it comes to uh, to the top positions we need to do a lot uh, lastly, uh, the African trade, for, uh, trade I mean free trade agreement, uh, we believe brings more opportunity for women businesses. About 70% uh, of uh, businesses in uh, Africa, in the informal trade, uh, the women businesses, close to 70%, uh, are owned by women, which we believe when these tariff barriers and other non tariff are eliminated, women will be better off. So we believe this kind of things will bring better for women. Well, gender equality is a value system in Singapore. So it's not even a question. Women go to schools, universities. In fact, uh, many of them, so they, they outnumber the men in universities. So, and they do a great job. And so everything that our colleagues have said, and I completely support that agenda. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to wrap up and say thank you to our amazing ambassadors. You, you are great partners to us in advancing the trade discussions. Um, I think together we can uh, make the world stronger, better, and more open for, for trade for everyone. And so just thank you so much. And I have to say thank you to Ken and the entire WIDA team for this amazing discussion. It's through dialogue that we share ideas, that we overcome differences, and, um, and, and create the kind of frameworks that we need for today and for tomorrow. So thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to our panel.
Uh, we are thrilled uh, to have had and welcomed uh, you ambassadors for joining us today.